Okay, so scenario three. This is something a very, very, very exceedingly rare scenario. 29-year-old man assaulted a bar. <laughs> All right? So, yeah, this I, is the red hair. And no one's ever seen this. All right, so uh, the scene is safe. He's beaten about the head and face. No other uh, injuries identified. Obvious smell of ETOH. Uh, vital signs uh, there. You can see them. Uh, his room air, pulse ox of 93%. Uh, that catches your attention. GCS of 5. Uh, he's, he's posturing. Uh, and the patient tolerates an oral airway. All right, what do you do first? We might say, uh, what do you do first after, what, what do you do next after C-spine? Maybe we say that. Okay, I think that would be helpful. Okay, non rebreather mask, good. So we've, we've hammered this one home. All right, five minutes into the care, uh, the patient's still breathing. Now respiratory rate's gone, dropped down to six, still oxygen and okay, vital signs are still okay. Um, you, this is a slightly extended transport, 25 minutes. What do you do next? Continue non rebreather, 15 liters without any positive pressure ventilation. Any takers? BVM at 10 breaths per minute throughout the transport. Any takers? BVM while preparing to intubate and then intubate either at scene or en route and ventilate at 10 breaths per minute. Three. And as you'll see, two or three are acceptable ones. It depends. In their system, is there an experienced intubator? So it's a lot of potential issues. Patient taken to level one trauma center after initial resuscitation, CT patient went to OR for removal of a acute subdural. Here were your outcomes. If you use the cadence device uh, or a cadence device with a BVM and after intubation, you kept the rate at 10 breaths per minute. Uh, two, immediately placed an Intel CO2 monitor and you meticulously kept the Intel CO2 at 35 to 45 throughout the care. Then you did significantly well. He ends up with major improvement and only mild cognitive problems and a bit of memory loss. Is it fair to say that we're ventilating this patient? Not like axioms that I can hand off to the medics. If you're a bad patient, just pretend you're squeezing that patient's brain. If you're squeezing it too much, that's bad. Okay. So Dan, Dan had one that we, we, we kind of like, the one about the walk around. Which one? The, the breathe, walk around the ambulance, get out. Oh, well, yeah, no, it's both, it's both issues. And in fact, one of our patients we're going to show you is really, I think, incredibly instructive. But remember, both hyperventilation, which is too fast by definition, and overventilation. Excessive ventilation. Uh, overventilation, which means either squeezing too hard or having too much of a, 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 a minute ventilation, and usually those all go together. This, this actually does significant damage to the lungs. The other thing it does that's important to remember is if they have any issues, if they're already almost hypotensive, that positive pressure ventilation decreases venous return to the heart and can make them shocky, yeah, even if it doesn't show up a lot in your blood pressure as one of the seven, you decreased it for a few years. So one of the things we're gonna have on the website is a, um, a PowerPoint that many of you likely have, but a PowerPoint on waveforms, the, the actual yes. It's morphology of a waveform that we're looking for, not this tall, peaked, you know, sharp yes. uh, sky riser waveform, but actually a long, drawn out waveform, not excessively drawn out, but um, that will, you know, not just like Dan said, the, the rate of ventilation, but also the volume and the force. Okay. Uh, if you use a cadence device, Entel CO2 monitoring are not used, or if Entel CO2 is between 30 to 32 for more than just a few minutes, patient has profound neurologic disability and is discharged to a nursing home. If Entel CO2 is less than 30 for more than just a few minutes, patient never wakes up from surgery, has a GCS of three throughout his course, and has uh, dies of neurologic death. And by the way, this is not dreamland. What's amazing is the literature is now showing that these kind of differences would literally, I mean, who would have thought most of us, without help, without a cadence device, most of us are way lower than this. I mean, this is how powerful this may be. Way more important than neurosurgeons, frankly. That's what's both tragic and really cool about this knowledge. Okay. Um, so notes, main point of the scenario is no matter how experienced uh, an expert they are, inadvertent hyperventilation is universal. Uh, unless you use some kind of adjunct to prevent it. Even moderate hyperventilation kills brain cells immediately and causes major 
morbidity and death. So it's that important. Uh, other points, um, even if you have a monitoring device, you should immediately use a cadence device and a pressure control bag that we're going to demonstrate here in a minute um, for, the, for the initial ventilations until you're able to initiate the entile CO2 monitoring. So you need to, you don't just wait until you got everything hooked up to start measuring entile CO2. Otherwise, you will hyperventilate and overventilate until um, you get the entile CO2 started. Um, this is a key. Optimal measurement, well, you go through it then. Okay. This is really a key for everybody. By the way, one of the things you're going to see here is we see you as the master trainers, as what you do in the classroom is really important. But the reality is you're also probably some of the key people in the state to actually improve the level of care. Uh, that it goes far beyond just certifying people in what you do. So notice, what's really, really clear is what's best is that as soon as the first, your first puff is with a pressure control bag and a cadence device, meaning your first puff happens now and your second one doesn't happen for six seconds, that you're literally starting ventilation like that. And in tidal CO2 is quickly applied so that you can moderate your rate and so forth to make sure that you're uh, near 40 for your target. Uh, and then getting on your ventilator, not doing half the flight, not doing half the flight. I was an uh, air medical director for 18 years. Not doing half the flight, saying, ah, you know, I don't really like that. No. I, I'm mad they bought that one, or whatever it is. Uh, uh, that they get on the ventilator as soon as, po as possible. The next best is the cadence device and the pressure control bag and in tidal CO2 monitoring, but you don't have a vent, so you don't have a vent. And then acceptable is a cadence device and a pressure control bag. And completely not acceptable is what almost all of us are doing for long periods of time nowadays, frankly, even if we have ventilators to put them on. That's the, the take-home the take message here. Who usually does the ventilation on the patient? Back valve mass ventilation. Which EMT? no matter what they look like, is indicative of increased intracranial pressure. But that's different than herniation. And that's why this person had equal and reactive pupils, okay? So remember, it's the entire complex of profoundly dropping GCS, especially extensor posturing or, or nothing, a three. And remember we had a GCS of three in patient number two? But that person's not herniating. They're going to actually wake up 15 minutes later if we do it right. Uh, it's not the GCS per se, or even the posturing per se, it's also the lateralizing findings, except we, except, especially either the blown pupils on both sides, or the... It's really important we don't overcall the yeah. herniation oh, yeah. thing, because that, that's, that's a huge pitfall, right? If we start hyperventilating everybody because we think they're herniating, it has to be all those things in combination. In fact, let me, let me add this to that. There, um, I defy you... I defy you to find a person in your practice who is actually herniating in the pre-hospital setting that ends up with a good outcome. That before your eyes is actually herniating and they're not already in the operating room. Because remember, how long does it take for the, for the brain to have low flow to start killing brain cells? Somewhere between four and five minutes. And after 10 minutes of profound decreased perfusion, it doesn't matter what else anybody does. So the, so that's another reason why we want people to undercall. The herniation, the herniation thing is such a last ditch effort. Absolutely. It's it's a Hail Mary. It's not what we should be and looking to try to try to to try to save people. Yeah. Well, one other thing, you know, Dan talked about this, but this is really important not just in TBI, this is important in all intubated patients and in all kind of low flow patients. This is post cardiac arrest patients. We should be using all the same technologies and diligence for how we ventilate patients after cardiac arrest, uh, in a, in a, in especially. So we can help a lot of people if we do all this. Well, yeah. as I, I have two paramedic classes going on right now that I'm instructing with. And when I teach them to intubate, 
they drop the tube, they watch the tube go past the cores, they inflate the cuff, they give a respiration, and we teach them to listen over the epigastrum. Mm -hmm. And now I'm gonna have them wait for six seconds before they listen to the lower left lobe. Then, uh, oh, I don't think I two, don't think breaths, two, two or three breaths. Drive that. Uh, no, so so you want to verify that your yeah. tube's in the right place. Yeah. So basically, okay. you're doing three breaths. Dominic but, 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 yeah. but you, well, but you are picking, but you are picking up on the issue of uh, three minutes of poor brain perfusion probably matters a lot. Okay. So if we if we kind of oh yeah we're gonna we're gonna get them to the vent. And what happens is that happens later. But you've got to make sure the tube's in the right place. Yeah, tube in the right place, and then every single breath is at the right rate. I think it's fair to say it's less of an issue doing three breaths while you're trying to verify tube placement versus the minute that yeah, you Yeah, that's correct. Oh, as I soon as you're it, sure you're in, this it. is really important. That's right. Okay. So, so, regardless to the entire CO2 monitoring, I can, you know, I can understand the innovation tube or the King Airway, but just doing a bag valve mask, it, it, how accurate is that? Because you mean not the, you mean the entitled? Yeah. Um, it's, it depends who you talk to. Okay. We, ben and I have talked to several of the of the uh, manufacturers about this, and the problem is, of course, it's not a closed space. Yeah, it's so, it's so it can under it tends to underestimate. It tends to be too low. It tends to be an your your true reading is probably actually higher than what you're seeing because you're probably losing CO2 through the mm -hmm. through the creases and so forth, but. Uh, so that's why we haven't focused at all. If you're doing bag valve mask, ironically, the good news is if you're doing bag valve mask, you probably can't ventilate them nearly as well as you can with an ET tube, and that's probably good. But if you use the entitled, you'll, you'll still get an accurate rate. Yes. I mean, even as still that's an accurate that's yes. exactly right. That's, that's a right. very good number. point. You'll still be able to see You will be able to see down. what your rate has been, which is a very good point. Yeah. So we still want capnography. If you, if yep. you have capnography, yep. use it. Use it. Right. Right. On dive mask work, especially right. in the And again, if you've got them at 35 and it's really 45, we're still okay. Still good. Uh, if you've got them That's at 32, right. probably you're too low. If you got them at 28, almost certainly you're too low. <laughs> okay, so this we talked about this one, but again, you know, we're not talking about brand names, selling brand names. We're talking about you know technologies to help us achieve these these uh, goals. Um, so if people, you know, we don't want you to get into fights over, you know, technology. And if you're teaching a class, um, it's probably it's probably best to remind people what the optimal treatment is, what, what where we're trying to go. We do want you to go back to the people who make decisions about some of these things cost. Yeah. We do want you to go back and say, but you know what? In a small set, we're we're not talking every single EMS patient run we go on. But we're talking about two or three percent of the patients who we may be able to make the most impact on their outcome. So uh, that's the way to frame it. Um, okay. So let's um, let's do the sort of the fourth scenario now, and and then we'll take a quick break. Yeah, and, but we'll I, I do want to kind of follow up because this still goes with exactly what we're talking about. So JT and Bruce have some devices here that we can kind of walk through. Yeah. Sure. All right, so first of all, uh, hold on just a sec. This is the cadence device. This is a really super simple thing. I'm going to go ahead and activate them and throw them on there. You borrow that one, Jim. And they just uh, stick on there, send them around, hold on to those little plastic job reviews. This is the smart bag, and, and again, we don't have stock or anything in smart bag. It's just something that we found that we think might have a good out, uh, good, uh, be a good adjunct for us. So if you squeeze it too fast, it vents overboard. Okay. If you squeeze too hard, it vents overboard. So what you want to do is just try to not ever let that engage. So a nice breath will let you do it. Isn't that, isn't that amazing how ridiculous, you feel like you're killing the patient, right? What do you mean that's all I squeeze? That literally is all we squeeze. And then with the little cadence device on there, so just tell your EMT just to watch that little thing and squeeze. <laughs> because when they start going, bring that backboard over here and get that guy and you come over here, they're going like this, right? So this is a culture change that we have to make in order to make this work. We've got to get them, you guys are the most important guys. Just like in MICR, CCR, the compressors are the most important, the guy holding the bag is the most important.